you know, if we think that just, you know, you, the European Christian experience is the only uh, measuring stick for whether Christianity is doing well in the world, I think we are mistaken. Hi, I'm Evelyn Ray. Welcome to the Cauldron Pool Show. Tonight, I am joined with Nathan Anderson. He is a Christian. He is a documentary filmmaker, and he is the very reason why I started looking into a more positive hopeful view of eschatology and I'll forever be grateful for that because it has been one of the greatest sort of transformations in my faith um, since I became sort of more reformed with my theology. But I, I'm really grateful that you could join me tonight and um, really excited to sort of get into this with you. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks for the invitation. Now, I sort of mentioned your documentary uh, was, you know, a huge um catalyst for a lot of theological changes within myself. And it was especially really good timing considering the way of the world in the last sort of few years. But before we sort of get into the specifics of the documentary, obviously you're a documentary filmmaker, but I'd love for you to sort of introduce yourself, a little bit of your background um, and sort of and what you do with yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, my yeah, my name is Nathan Anderson. I live in Chile in South America. I have two kids. I'm married. Um, and um, yeah, so before um, jumping into, you know, working with with documentaries, which has actually been something that's been fairly recent. And, uh, you know, really, that that first film, kind of, um, uh, you know, helped me to transition into doing this more more full time. Um, I was you know doing a number of, of different things, um, working with our local church, um, also worked with um, with YWAM for a number of years. And actually well my parents um, came to Chile originally as as missionaries with YWAM. So youth with a mission. Um, so yeah, I've I've been involved in in a number of different um, you know, ministries and, and and projects throughout the years, um, and yeah, now I've I'm uh, pretty much full time uh, making films. That's a pretty cool job, I must admit. I mean, I, I thought I had a pretty cool job as being like an undercover detective, but to be honest, I think making films and documentaries is kind of way cooler. You have a lot more scope, a lot more things that you can do. Um, and, you know, to, and to your credit, um, your documentaries are like just very high quality, really good um, and really captivating. So um, yeah, credit to you, but I want to dive straight into the first documentary um, on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I sort of watched this when it first came out and I got really excited. Um, and Doug Wilson is one of the uh, pastors that you interviewed in this documentary. And he said uh, something similar along the lines of, you know, his transformation into like reform theology was like one of the most exciting parts of his Christian walk. And then the most recent exciting thing for him was when he became a post mill um, with his eschatological sort of worldview. And after watching this documentary film that you made and after sort of going into things myself and doing a bit of research, a bit of study, it also became incredibly exciting for me because it just changed how I viewed the world. And as a Christian, what I felt my purpose and my role was here on earth. But I don't want to butcher the plot. I don't want to butcher what, what the documentary was. I'd love to hear from you what that documentary is exactly um, and why you felt the need or the want to create this film. Yeah, so, well, On Earth As It Is In Heaven started out as a project. Um, originally, it was um, pretty, um, uh, my, my aspirations with it were, were pretty um, um, conservative in terms of, I was just trying to make a film um, here for the South America, for the um, Latin American uh, com community. Um, to present the whole idea of postmillennialism, because at that time there wasn't very many. There was maybe one or two books that were, you know, you know, that presented a little bit of postmillennialism that were translated into Spanish, but there was really no material, uh, pretty much. And so I originally started out 
um, doing a number of interviews of pastors and a few missionaries here in, in Chile, here in South America. It was all going to be in Spanish, uh, but it was my first film. So I made a lot of mistakes with audio and lighting and, and all those kinds of things. Um, and so I was going to have to reshoot all of those interviews um, because, yeah, they, they weren't usable or, or weren't very high quality, let's say, um, in terms of my the production level on them. But then I had the chance to travel to the States for the summer, and that opened up the door to then, you know, try to do some interviews while I was there. And um, I ended up just never reshooting those other interviews and just, um, you know, using the, the ones I, I, I did during my, my trip. And it, they were all in English. So then I was like, well, I'm not going to have all the all the narration voiceovers in Spanish and then, you know, half in English, half in Spanish, that's just going to be weird. So I just re-recorded all that into English and it kind of shifted the focus a little bit. And, um, and I think it was, you know, the, the best, you know, decision in the end, because it opened it up to a, a wider audience. And um, yeah, I, I, I've been blown away at, um, you know, how many people have been able to, to see it and, and just be presented with this, post-millennial perspective that I, I think, you know, in our time, um, even in the reformed world is kind of uh, something that is seen as, as almost fringe or something on the back burner, something that's not, uh, you know, something that, you know, people a long time ago believed. And that was kind of interesting. You know, that's, that's interesting that they had those ideas, but today we know better kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Um and so I think it was, or, or the, the goal, you know, really I have with it is just mostly presenting in part my own journey in the film, um, what, what it, how it worked out for me, um, learning about this subject and, and coming to this, having this change of, of perspective in terms of eschatology compared with um, just the general view I grew up with, I guess. And so that's, you know, kind of what I try to reflect in the film uh, a bit. And yeah, I had the amazing opportunity to talk to some very, very smart people, uh, and very, very knowledgeable pastors and theologians uh, on the subject. So I'm very grateful for that as well, you know? So mm -hmm. that's basically the what the movie's about. Mm. Well, it's funny, um, uh, you know, talking about you speaking to some very smart people. Um, I very, I have no idea why he agreed to it, but Doug Wilson um, agreed to go on the podcast. And it's funny, you know, every person has like a bit, a little bit of star sort of struck emotions about things. Um, and, you know, I guess people, some people would be like super thrilled to have famous sportsmen, Olympians, they'd like, you know, Hollywood actors and actresses. But my moment of being starstruck was having Doug Wilson on my podcast. I felt so silly because I was, I just, you know, he's just been so um, instrumental in my theology and especially trying to delve through what we've been thrown at the last few years. I find that there are few uh, pastors who are willing to dip into the political sort of cultural um, type of things as well as theology, whereas he is. So that was my moment. And, you know, obviously you probably had similar sorts of feelings, I'm guessing, because there were some incredible uh, people that you were able to interview during this documentary. But what I really want to sort of ask you is, you know, obviously you started this documentary to sort of also document, like you mentioned, your own journey and your own sort of, um, I guess, transformation with um, a hopeful sort of view of end times. Um, how did you get there? Because, I mean, I got there because of this documentary of yours. Um, you just mentioned there aren't many books, especially where you are. It's a fairly... Uh, you know, old type thing. So how is it that you found yourself delving into this sort of eschatology? Yeah. So um, in my case, it was, um, uh, I, I was introduced to the whole idea of partial preterism a long time ago. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the idea that a lot of the prophecies in Revelation and Matthew 24 were actually fulfilled 
um, in the past were fulfilled in the, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Mm -hmm. But even when I was introduced to that, I was, you know, more of an amillennialist at that point. And so I hadn't really considered postmillennialism very much. I mean, I, I kind of knew it existed, but I, you know, and that they were, they had kind of an, a, an optimistic view, but I, I didn't, I never really studied it or, or took it all that seriously. And it, but it was actually also listening to Doug Wilson that, um, you know, really um, got me thinking in, in that direction. And I don't completely remember if it was his, his book, Heaven Misplaced, which is a short book he wrote, or, or if it was a sermon series that he, um, that I listened to from him. Um, that um, I think it's, I don't remember the, the name of the sermons here. I think it, it, it says on the cover of it, you know, from, you know, from the river to the ends of the earth or something like that. Um, and so lit, especially listening to those, those, um, those, um, those sermons was very helpful to me because the sermons didn't have much to do with, you know, with Matthew 24 or revelation. They had to do with bigger issues in terms of, um, you know, what does it mean that Christ is a savior of the world? And what, what is the um, position of Satan, you know, at this time? And, um, you know, how, what does it mean to disciple nations and, and those kind of issues, which I think are often overlooked. Like a lot of people don't even consider those to be part of things that should be part of an eschatological discussion, you know? Um, a lot of people think that eschatology is all about just, you know, you know, arguing over the details of events leading up to the second coming of Christ or something like that. But um, I, for me, and from a post-millennial perspective, it, it's completely different in that regard. Eschatology has more to do with our view of history, our view of the kingdom of God, our view of the work of God in history and our place in that, uh, in, in, in that project, basically. And so, um, yeah, listening to, to that um, really um, shifted my view, I think, in terms of, of eschatology and got me to start reading, you know, different authors and, um, and, and different um, uh, books on postmillennialism. And, and yeah, and that's what ultimately um, inspired me to, to make a film about it and, um, and hopefully be able to explain um, some of those concepts. Mm. Growing up for me, um, uh, you know, I've sort of mentioned this before on the podcast. I grew up with a father who would read me Revelation as as like a scary story, as like, you know, um, like an exciting thrill sort of thing. And, and we used to grow up and watch the Left Behind series. Um, and also when I sort of first came into Reformed theology, John MacArthur was a huge person that I would listen to and he's very much, um, you know, Jesus is going to come on, on this cloud. We're all going to disappear. And, you know, and so I sort of was really in that space um, and I found it exciting. And, you know, when the world started becoming very globalist, I was like, oh, maybe this is the one currency. This is the one, um, you know, this is the one language, the one ruler. Maybe this is the Antichrist. And so I would get caught up in trying to figure out the timeline and I'd almost get distracted and lose interest in how I should probably be living my life and what I'm called to do in the fact that Christ is king now, currently. Um, and so coming into this space, I'm like, wow, I feel like I lost so many years of my life worrying about, you know, sitting on the train and, and I'm going to disappear and my clothes are going to be left instead of actually spreading the gospel, probably how I should be. Um, so it, it really does change. Like a lot of people say it's a non-salvational issue. So depending on whether, whatever, uh, you know, eschatological view you have, it doesn't mean you're going to heaven or hell, basically. So it's, it's I guess, a little bit like infant baptism in, in a way um, that you're not going to go to heaven or hell, depending on what your view is on those sorts of things. But I really do think it's a bigger issue than people realize the their sort of views on end times, because it really does shape you as a Christian. I really think it helps you bear really good fruits of the spirit um, being here on earth. So yeah, it's been such a good journey, but you know, 
a lot of people aren't really open to it. As you said, it's kind of like a fringe thing. It's certainly a fringe thing over here in Australia. Um, I think America and the ministers in America are possibly potentially leading the way with this post-millennialism. Um, so I've been going there for a lot of resources and a lot of things like that. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask you as well, um, if you don't mind sort of getting into it for people who might be listening who who don't really understand what post-millennialism actually is. And um, if, if you're happy to and comfortable to, if you can kind of explain that as best you can. Sure. Well, um, you know, the, the different views of the millennia or, or the different views that we, we discuss have, you know, you hear it in the name post-millennialism. It refers uh, to the millennium mentioned in Revelation 20. And so, you know, people talk about three basic views. One would be premillennialism, one would be amillennialism, and, and the third would be postmillennialism. And if you notice, they all relate to this uh, issue of the millennium. And that's mentioned in a few verses of uh, Revelation 20, where Christ uh, begins to rule for a thousand years with his saints, basically. And so the question is, uh, for a lot of people, where what is that talking about? Where does that happen? And so, for example, for premillennialists, they believe Christ will return to earth will rule for a thousand years here on earth with his, uh, with his people. Um, and then only, and after all of that will be the, the, the final judgment and the, uh, you know, the, the eternal state, basically. Um, all millennialists believe that, no, actually the, the millennium is not referring to this uh, period on earth where, where Christ is ruling after his second coming, but it's actually, uh, well, they, they actually have a few different views of, of it. Sometimes they, they say, well, it's, it's happening in heaven. Christ is ruling in heaven with his saints. And, and, and so this, but the, the period of time of the millennium is between the first and second coming from their perspective, either way. And post-millennialism, um, well, you know, post obviously after, so, so Christ returns after the millennium, that's, you know, uh, what postmillennialism believes, but specifically the it, it has to do with the nature of the the uh, current period and um, the the idea that ultimately the the work of the church in history through the power of the Holy Spirit will lead to an ex extended period of um, of blessing and prosperity here on the earth where the nations come to Christ, where the nations embrace Christianity, and where, you know, for a long time, though, before Christ returns, the whole world pretty much becomes Christian. Like, that's uh, basically what it, uh, what it has to do with. And um, the major difference, I guess, with the other perspectives is, well, both uh, and this is very interesting because uh, this is a point where both premillennialism and amillennialism agree for the most part. They believe that the present age um, is is uh, an evil age, and it's an age where, yes, there is some gospel advance and the gospel does grow, but evil grows as well. And evil actually grows faster than the gospel mm -hmm. grows in this world. And so... Um, the, the expectation they have from now until the second coming is that uh, the, the, the Satan will have the upper hand in history um, until Christ returns. The only thing that can change Satan having the upper hand and, and, and the nations being given over to Satan for the most part is the return of Christ, right? Either to start this millennial kingdom or... Um, to enter into the second, uh, to the final judgment and the eternal state. And so it's very interesting because on that point, they're, the, both groups are in agreement, actually, even though, you know, people will usually look at amillennialism and premillennialism and say, oh, those are very different systems. But at least in terms of their, what I would consider pessimistic view of history, um, they are, are, are pretty lined up. And so obviously postmillennialism uh, on that front offers a very different understanding of 
uh, the nature and 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 direction that the kingdom of God is going in history. Like we we believe that the kingdom is growing, and every time the kingdom grows, uh, the kingdom of Christ uh, advances. The kingdom of Satan retreats, and mm-hmm. the the kingdom of Satan is diminished in this world, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because you know and and. That's, I think, is the biblical framework, because when we read the Bible, it, it talks about us, you know, uh, when, when someone comes to Christ, they, they leave the kingdom of darkness, and they come into the kingdom of light. And so, obviously, um, when that happens, the kingdom of Satan shrinks in this world. And so, mm-hmm. we believe that that's, um, because, I mean, obviously, uh, the other views do see times when the kingdom of Satan shrinks, but they see it as an ebb and flow where sometimes, you know, it's, it, 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 sometimes it, it goes up, sometimes it goes down, you know, kind of like the stock market, just, you know, mm. uh, it goes up and down. And sometimes the Christ kingdom is, is advancing, sometimes Satan kingdom is advancing, but overall Satan kingdom um, is going to have the, the upper hand. And in that final period, right before Christ returns, that's when, you know, Satan is going to really have a lot of power and, and you know, and, and the nations are all going to be given over to him when Christ returns. And so that's, that's some, uh, probably our, our main uh, point of, of, of contention, I guess, uh, or our main distinctives in terms of uh, the other views of eschatology that are out there. Um, in the uh, Christian and evangelical world. Mm. Yeah, it's funny how um, that you, you mentioned the different, like there are two sort of groups, even though there's differences within the groups, you, there are there's a real big line in the sand between a uh, hopeful eschatology and a pessimistic. And it seems like there's only kind of one that's, that's hopeful. Um, and, you know, it started off with 12 disciples, that's what it started off with. And you, I mean, you look at China, for example, they are a communist nation. They are literally discriminated against if they are Christian. They do not have the same freedoms that we do in the West, yet there are over 60 million professing Christians in China today. That's more than my entire country's uh, population in Australia. Like that's amazing to me. And you can see the gospel spreading throughout um, the world. Whether It's hard when particularly we're living in Western nations when it looks on the surface like things are decaying, like Satan is winning. I mean, you've got so many... Uh, you know, regressive agendas and things that make us look like we're going backwards and not forwards. But, uh, you know, when, when God sort of speaks, you know, the mountains sort of shook. And I feel like Western nations right now, like we're under his judgment. We've mocked him for too long and he's shaking us up. And if you're not holding onto something eternal, you will fall off the shelf and things will shatter. But I do think that, you know, as Christians, um, it's really sorting the wheat from the chaff and there is going to be like a new era of shepherds that's going to be born from this. And if you look at modern history, even they could, you could look at the the twenties, the thirties, the forties, you could look at so many different moments throughout our history and go, this is it. This is the end of the world. Because at that particular moment in a person's life, that's probably the worst thing they could imagine happening. The world wars that we went through, you know, all these other sorts of things. Um, yet we still keep going and there are still more Christians today than there ever have been um, in the entire world. Is, is that sort of an argument that you hear often when you've, you're faced with people who sort of question post-millennialism, like we're losing the battle here. How can you say that we're becoming Christianized? Yeah. I mean, in general, I would say there is this assumption and this, um, th- this view of decline in history, right? And that, you know, the good old days were, were, were you know, better than now um, kind of a, a view. That's very common. And, you know, it's kind of crazy, too, because, you know, I mean, even right now, we are communicating across uh, thousands of miles, you know, in different time zones and and everything. And we're having this conversation that, you know, uh, the richest kings, uh, you know, a a thousand years ago would never have dreamed of, you know, having. 
basically. And we think that we live in, a, in, in the worst time in history for some reason, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange uh, phenomena. Now, obviously, people will say, well, that's just technology. You know, we, you know wh what about the moral decay of our society and the, the, the decay in, uh, or the, the um, Christianity in the West, um, um, you know, not doesn't seem to be um, advancing or as as prevalent as it was in other times. And yeah, I mean, that's a that's an interesting point, I think. And it, it, but as you say that, you know, that is because we're going through a period of judgment, ultimately in the West as nations that have been built on the foundation of Christianity, then rejecting Christianity for the most part, uh, we are living out what the consequences of that are. And, but again, post-millennialism doesn't have any problem with times of, of judgment and, you know, times of, of difficulties, but we are saying that ultimately in the, on the grand scheme of things in the, in the large scale, Christianity is winning. And, uh, you know, when people say that and they say, well, look at, you know, in the 1600s or in the 1700s, look how many Christians were in Europe and all that. I say, okay, fine. But how many Christians were there in Iraq, right? How many Christians were there in China? How many Christians were there in Africa? And so, you know, if we think that just, you know, you, the European Christian experience is the only uh, measuring stick for whether Christianity is doing well in the world, I think we are mistaken, right? I mean, Christianity is more global today than it has ever been, right? Um, and there, there are more, as you said, there are more Christians today than any other point in history. Not, and it's interesting, not only in terms of, uh, not only in terms of numbers, because someone could say, sure, there's more Christians in now, but there's also more people on this planet, right? Um, and so, but even in terms of percentage wise, like, you know, almost a third of the world claims to be Christian, right? That has never been the case at, at other point in at other points in, in history, right? Um, you know, if you look at the statistics of Christianity down through the centuries, um, I don't have the numbers here, but I remember reading some statistics that like, you know, in the year 100 AD, um, there was something like one and in like 300 and something people on the planet were Christian, right? Um, and then you you start to, you know, go through history and, and the percentage doesn't really go over 10% until like the, uh, the 1900s, basically. So you have throughout history, the, you know, the vast, uh, the minor uh, Christianity being completely a minority uh, in history in terms of the global population. And then in the last few hundred years, you just have this explosion of Christianity around the world. So, so it's, it's actually very amazing to be living at this time. Um, if we really think about it in those terms and it's, and it's ironic too, because, you know, someone like Athanasius, uh, you know, I think he was writing in the, the fourth century or either third or fourth century. Um, like he's looking around and he's saying, yeah, I mean, that Christianity is growing all over the place. Uh, you know, the, the darkness is retreating. Uh, the light is advancing. Uh, he has this very optimistic view, even with that only those small results compared to what we are seeing today. Right. And so it, it's very ironic how, on the one hand, Christianity can be growing and expanding more than it ever has in history, like it's happening now. And on, at the same time, most evangelical Christians believing they're living in the terminal generation, that they're living in the worst point, you know, in history and that everything is unraveling and, and has to unravel. Biblically speaking, you know, prophetically speaking, this is what God has prophesied for the church is for everything to fall apart um, right before, you know, the end. And so it's, it's very interesting uh, and, and, and uh, to be living ultimately at this time. Mm. 
Yeah, right at the very beginning of time, you know, God spoke and he turned the chaos into order. And it's like for a long time, the West hasn't allowed God to speak. You mentioned, you know, the the West has sort of been built on these biblical foundations, these structures. And yeah, we we sort of allowed him through his moral laws and, and, and things to sort of speak to us. And that's how we built the West. And, and that's why chaos was turned into order. And that's why we have been quite prosperous, especially Christianity, you know, spreading throughout the world. But for, for a long time now, we've rejected God and we've essentially not allowed him to speak to us. And as we know, uh, it turns order back into chaos. And I think that's what we're seeing at the moment. A lot of people um, struggle to understand um, the post-millennialism, especially when it comes to how does that mean we proceed as Christians? And you get into the debate about legalism and theonomy and things like that. And a lot of people sort of freak out, um, especially when you talk about those things, like how the practicality of that, you know, But the way that I understand is regeneration happens so that we can keep the law, so that we can keep God's law. Um, And what I wanted to sort of ask you is how do we get that to apply to a world that hates God's law? Yeah, the the issue of God's law is is, um, uh, is very important and and interesting in our our day and age, especially I think a lot of of resulting in from the influence of dispensationalism. Um, a lot of evangelicals have a very diminished view of God's law, or they believe God's law only, uh, you know, had to do with the Jews um, or something like that. But um, Western civilization has recognized throughout time uh, the importance of, of God's law. And it's been something that has a very, uh, you know, even you think of, of um, someone like, like King Alfred, right? And we think of British common law and how, you know, uh, God's word and even specifically books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy made their way directly into a lot of the, the, the laws that were established. You know, you, you read the, you know, uh, what what Alfred um, laid down and you know just the, there's all these uh, laws about oxen and all that that come mm-hmm. directly from uh, from Leviticus and so it's very um, interesting when we consider that and how you know the whole um, Christian civilization was built on on those principles now obviously we can have um this Um, Obviously, we could have a discussion about how a specific law applies or, you know, does it apply in this day and age? But what I think um, even what where we're what we're seeing right now is so I mean, we live in a society that's so far away from God's law that we don't even almost need to argue about those things. Like, I mean, can we at least agree that, uh, uh, you know, it should be illegal to um, butcher babies, right? I mean, could we, at, at, like, would that be a Christian principle? Like, how, whatever your view of how the law applies, I mean, shouldn't that be a bare minimum point of, of agreement mm-hmm. um, as Christians? And so it, so it, I, I think it's interesting that so, so many of the issues we're facing are just so fundamental and basic that even if we could have, disagreements about, oh, well, does this or that law apply today? Um, so much of it is just, you know, is, is just basic. Uh, and, and, and which makes things, you know, pretty simple. I mean, if you have people in the church seriously arguing that mothers should have the right to uh, abort their children, to butcher their babies, um, yeah, that's that should be uh, something where we're not even that's not even a, a discussion. You know, if you should if you're arguing that, uh, you know, kids, you know, boy, little boys uh, should be allowed to wear dresses and and pretend to be girls. Um, and and th- I mean, those are just basic things at this point. And again, I like with what you were saying, Evelyn, I think this period is is bringing out 
and, and separating uh, the wheat from the chaff. Um, I mean, can, when we can't even agree that um, going to church is, is a fundamental thing and mm-hmm. that government shouldn't be allowed to keep you from going to church and pastors shouldn't listen to governments who try to uh, keep Christians from going to church. Like, I mean, we're down to the bare minimum at that point. Um, mm-hmm. and, and seeing how the church is responding is really, I think, realigning um, evangelicalism in a mm-hmm. way that is very helpful, you know? Um, and because sometimes you're, you know, when, when, when God wants to do something powerful in history, sometimes the problem is your army's too big, right? Mm-hmm. Your, the tent's too big. And so you see the story of Gideon, right? where uh, his army was too big. Um, God had to say, no, um, most of those guys need to go home. And, um, and, and, and only then did God, uh, you know, do the, that powerful work of, of bringing his people to victory in that situation. And so, you know, I think in some ways we might be experiencing something similar where the hypocrisy um, and, and the, um, cowardice of portions of evangelicalism is being exposed and, and people, you know, even if people don't agree with this or that, you know, uh, doctrinal issue, even if people aren't post-millennial, at least they're seeing, wow, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna align myself with the people that are at least going to church and that are at least, uh, you know, doing some of those things that 50 years ago were pretty basic to, mm. to be a, a Christian. And so, um, so yeah, most definitely, uh, I don't know, I might've gone on a, on a rabbit trail <laughs> there, but, uh, I think that we are experiencing, uh, uh an important, uh, realignment, um, during this time of judgment, but it's exposing um, a lot of, of the, the faults and a lot of the, mm-hmm. the, our weaknesses as evangelical Christians. Yeah. I, John Calvin once said, you know, if you want to judge a nation, you give them bad leaders. And I think we're seeing that particularly by our governments and, and as well in our churches. Um, and, you know, I think that it is going to birth something new and it is, it sort of gets a, a lot of people are starting to question um, their church. A lot of people are starting to actually read the Bible again. There are so many people because of what's happening, who are turning to God, because nature hates a void. And at the moment, everybody has this big void in their life and everybody feels it. Everyone's trying to fill it. And there are things that they're trying to fill it with that are not working. So people are turning to God. And so you are sort of seeing the gospel do these magical things, these amazing things through these hard times. Um, And, you know, a lot of people feel like, uh, theonomy, theocracy, a lot of people who feel, you know, God's law is actually restrictive are starting to sort of open their eyes and see that, um, you know, that God's law and and things like that is actually freedom and, and his moral law and his understanding actually gives you freedom and that freedom without that kind of virtue is chaos. Um, and, you know, you, you sort of see um, that, People who um, don't obey God's laws just makes them, we're all sinners, but it just makes them, I guess, <laughs> greater sinners. And so when people freak out about um, the idea of post-millennialism, Christians taking over the world, I like to remind them that we're all sinners, at just at varying and different degrees. Um, and it's it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, but I wanted to sort of ask you, what, what would you sort of say to people who, um, I guess, Christians, particularly who don't like the idea of forcing Christianity on people or theocracy, that type of way, like, what would you sort of say to them to sort of counter that sort of argument? Well, in, in the for, in the first place, I would say that, you know, and I think this is something Douglas Wilson said a number of times that theocracies are inevitable. The only question Mm -hmm. is who is theos? Who is God? Who's the God of the system? Right. And, and so it's not a question of whether we're, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a Christian theocracy or whether we're just going to have a, a theocracy-less 
society or a, or a free society, um, because ultimately, you know, there's always a God of the system. You know, there, there's always something or someone sitting on the throne of the system. And I mean, we've seen that in in recent years. I mean, in, in this this whole COVID thing has brought it out. You know, I mean, how much you know uh, virtue signaling and 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 uh, and and what you know people would you know the 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 kind of stereotypical uh, puritanism, quote unquote, that so, that has so often been associated with with uh, with reform theology has actually been uh, a characteristic of. The modern Pharisees of our day, ultimately, you know, it, you know, trying to show themselves as a virtuous one and, oh, well, this guy didn't have a mask at this event and they take a picture of it and they take a picture of themselves wearing a mask as some kind of uh, virtuous uh, mm -hmm. thing. And so ultimately, there's always a standard. The question is, whose standard is going to be um, enforced? And that and the other point is there always is a level of of coercion. In a society, like I mean, uh, there always has to be, you know, people are not just freely going to not steal from each other, right? There has to be some kind of consequences for stealing, for example. Mm -hmm. And now, are those consequences going to be according to our what we think is best, um, you know, or is it going to be according to God's law? And 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 is and this is the real question because even if you think that you know, all, all those laws were just for Israel, just for, for that polity. Um, were they just, I mean, did, did God give Israel bad laws uh, or something like that? Um, and so uh, ultimately the, the law of God is a restraint on tyranny. Ultimately the law of God is, is freedom. And the law of God keeps, uh, for example, uh, tyrants from imposing unjust penalties. Uh, for example, if, if somebody decided tomorrow that from now on thieves um, are going to get their hands cut off every time they steal, uh, the law of God is a restraint on that. The law of God says, no, that is not just. You're not allowed. That's not on the table, right? For you as a civil magistrate, you have limits. You don't have a blank check. You can't just impose whatever you want because you're if the authority you have is God-given authority. And it's very interesting because we understand limits in other areas. We we understand that you know husbands have limits in terms of their authority over their wives and children. Uh, we have to understand that pastors have limits over their congregation. They can't just you know tell their congregation to, to do whatever they feel like, um, uh, enforcing they, they like, and we understand that, but for some reason, when it comes to the civil area, we think, no, I mean, that God's law doesn't apply there. Uh, and it, it, we, Christianity isn't really about legislating morality or isn't about those things. Another very important, I think probably one of the most important points is that, Ultimately, uh, the post-millennial perspective is not imposing Christianity on society, ultimately, because um, the prophecies uh, like Isaiah 2, for example, that speak of the nations embracing the gospel mm -hmm. and not only the gospel, but embracing the law of God. I mean, Isaiah 2 says, you know, uh, the Torah, the law of God will 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 flow out from Zion to the nations that and the nations will flow to Zion um, uh, to to the church to be taught in the ways of God. And so if you notice in there and and uh, in other passages they speak of the nation and I think Psalm 72 also speaks of the nations freely coming uh, mm -hmm. to the Lord in that sense. And so um, you know another prophecy speaks of Christ being the desire of the nations. The coastlands are waiting for his law, you know, Isaiah 42. And so all these passages speak of something that's voluntary, speak of something that the nations embrace, not something that is, you know, it's not that we put together this Christian militia and take over the world. We're not Islamists in that sense. We're not trying to uh, 
uh, take over the world by violence. We're, we're taking over the world by preaching the gospel. And that has the, the, the slow but sure effect of transforming individuals who transform their families, who transform their communities, and ultimately transform their nations. And so it is something that happens freely in that sense. And I, I, I remember uh, there's a very interesting moment in a, in, uh, a debate between uh, Doug Wilson and I think it was Andrew Sullivan, who was a, uh, a gay activist in the United States um, and uh, um, journalist. And um, at one point, at near the end of the debate, he says, you know, like, uh, you know, Doug, you know, you, uh, this is a democracy. You can't impose your, uh, your, your theocracy or your, uh, your, your Christian morality uh, on, our, on our democracy. This is a free country or something along those lines. And then, uh, um, then Doug Wilson just kind of answered, well, what if democracy wants God's law? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andrew was kind of put back. He's like, well, no, no, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Are you sure about that? <laughs> mm. It so, is actually so a really good yeah. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say it is actually a really good point because I was going to say it, it's probably important that we say we're not here to enforce with with a club and a baton, you know, theocracy, and this is how you'll do it. I think people submit to God's law through the spreading of the gospel, and as you mentioned, when they submit to Christ, then they will obey His laws. They will want to. That will be the desire of their hearts. It's the sanctification. It's that spiritual growth, the bearing of good fruit. Um, And it is a natural and inevitable um, positive consequence of having the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you and being completely, you know, regenerated. Um, And so it's a beautiful thing when you look at it. It's not this big, scary thing with clubs. Like we're going to enforce this, us Christian knighthood on, on, you know, horses with swords. It's, it doesn't work that way. Um, So I'm actually glad that you brought that up because that is something I really wanted to sort of cover off on. um, So people don't have an aneurysm at home and who, you know, think uh, that we're saying things that we're not. But um, I, I just wanted to sort of move on um, to sort of, your your next documentary, which is on something called Law TV. It's L-O-O-R TV. Um, I'm actually having the guy who created Law TV on a podcast with me um, very shortly. So I'm going to go into what that is exactly. So I don't feel like you, I won't uh, get you to sort of explain that. I'll do an episode on what that is. But you do have a documentary series that is on that um, Law TV. I'd love you to sort of quickly explain um, what that is. Obviously, it's in the same spectrum about post-millennialism, but I guess why you decided to do like a longer series and what that will sort of, um, I guess, possess as opposed to the single standing documentary you did earlier. Yeah, so the, the, my, my current uh, project is called Teach All Nations and it's, on, it, it's being released on Lure TV. And it's a follow-up to, to my first film. I decided to change the format a little bit. So it's, um, it's in a docu-series format. So it's, it's going to be five episodes, um, about 30, 40 minutes each episode. And, and I mean, in the end, it'll be similar in length to my first film because my first film was about two hours or an hour and 50 minutes or something like that. Um, and so this is going to be, yeah, a little, a little bit longer. but um, you know, what the, the idea of this series has to do with how does post-millennialism apply practically in terms of the Christian worldview. And it's not so much going to look into, uh, you know, prophetic passages and, and all these kinds of issues. So in some, some people would even say it's not really, uh, about eschatology so much. Uh, but my idea with it is looking at how Christianity applies to all areas of life. And ultimately, it, it also kind of has the, the purpose of, uh, you know, imagine, you know, somebody who comes to this conclusion that, wow, okay, the world's not ending. This isn't the terminal generation. 
the rapture is not just right around the corner. And if that's true, then I, you know, my plans have kind of changed <laughs> mm. because I was planning to be out of here in the next few years, but now I'm going to have to stick around. Um, so what do we do now? I mean, what do I do with my life and, and how do we, where do we go from here, basically? Mm. And so I attempt to, you know, start a conversation about that. Um, with this series and look at different aspects of the Christian worldview and specifically how also, how do we, uh, what, how do we respond to the chaos that's, you know, been generated in the world around us uh, through, especially in these times of, uh, especially since 2020 and everything that that's happened and, and a lot of the political shifts that are happening around the globe, you know, in our countries. Mm -hmm. And so um yeah, I'm, I'm, it, it, the, the goal is to kind of, uh, you know, look at a way forward and what we should be doing as Christians uh, in the midst of everything that's going on with that optimistic view, with that understanding that even yeah, these hard times um, shall pass ultimately. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be building for the future in the midst of the chaos that we see around us. Hmm. The, I, I've watched the first two episodes um, that have been released. I gave you all my loot because I was like, I need, I need more episodes. I got so into it, um, and I'm sort of on the edge of my seat. I always check the loot, and I'm like, oh, yeah. we're nearly there. <laughs> we're, ne we're nearly there. For people who don't understand loot, as I said, I'm going to do an episode on this law TV. Um, I think it's going to be huge. It'll it definitely for a Christian. It's a way better subscription than Netflix and all those other trash sort of things. But um, I was really impressed with some of the people that you have interviewed so far. I was really sad about Gary North um, and his passing. The last thing that he said was he felt, you know, he wanted to do a curriculum for, for kids um, and that was his next greatest calling in life and he and it broke my heart but I actually was I was really uh, amazed by the things that he had to say incredibly wise man and I felt like you did him such a service with how you sort of presented him and um, how you sort of you know gave him that amazing sort of send-off with that particular episode but you know I've I've learned so much just in these first two episodes and I'm really excited for the other ones to come but just sort of before we close and before I sort of wrap things up what's the biggest thing that you have learned personally um, through sort of filming and shooting these documentary series? Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, because it, it has been a process of trial and error. I mean, I only got into filmmaking about five or six years ago. Like that was, I hadn't ever really picked up a camera, uh, before then my wife was, has always been interested in, um, in photography, but yeah, I hadn't, didn't really have a background uh, in that. And so for me, all of this has been a, just a learning experience on the technical side of things, but also just the opportunity to, um, listen to and learn from, uh, just amazing people like Gary North and like, uh, George Grant and Douglas Wilson, mm -hmm. and these men that have been, uh, you know, doing this for so long and have been, had such a, uh, um, you know, a career of writing books and thinking about these subjects. It's, it's been truly amazing to, um, to, to learn from them. And I mean, I think in a lot of ways, I've just been reaffirmed in a lot of these convictions, you know, uh, it mm -hmm. just, it's even this morning before we had this interview, I was sitting down and, uh, uh editing. Right. And, uh, yeah, just, you, you hear, th uh, you know, going through it over and over again, hearing, uh, these different points. It, it's very convicting a lot of times. It's very um, encouraging also, you know, because um, all this is happening in real time. All this is happening. There's real situations going on every day in the world. And um, for me, it's it's been very comforting uh, to, to work on this project, you know, with everything that's going on. And, and yeah, I hope the end result is, is helpful to folks and, uh, and it kind of makes sense, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they kind of understand what I'm what I'm trying to to achieve. But ultimately, it's been an amazing 
learning experience for me. And, um, and yeah, just an amazing opportunity to sit down with, uh, with people that I believe to be some of the greatest uh, theologians of our Mm -hmm. time, you know, uh, in in many aspects. So um, yeah, it's been a, a, an amazing experience. Mm. I feel like I need to say this out loud for people who are listening. You cannot tell for a second that this is new for you, Nathan, because the quality, like I cannot express it enough. It is just sharp. It is incredible. Um, It looks like you've been doing this your whole life. This looks like it's your expertise. Like, and I'm not saying this to, you know, you know, to for any reason other than the fact that it's the simple truth, you, the quality and and how you've worked these documentaries is amazing and it presents so well and it makes it easier for us at home to digest. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for what you're doing. I'm encouraged by what you're, you're doing. You really have been incredibly pivotal in my own um, theological understanding of end times and I'll be forever grateful for you for that and I'm so grateful that God could use you for, for these things. I hope other people who are listening will li- watch your documentary. I've already handed it out to so many people who ask me, why are you post-mill? I'm like, well... Let me send you this link to this documentary. And then that kind of kickstarts them and they're always coming back. I want more. I want more. Well, he has this new series that's coming out. You must get on and watch it. Before we close, where can people go if they, one, want to watch your documentaries and two, if they want to support you um, with, with what you're doing as well? Sure. Yeah. I mean, people can find me on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and social media. Uh, but also you can go to my, the website is on earthfilm.net on earth film. And um, there, you can watch the film there. There's also links to YouTube and uh, uh, Amazon and, uh, and can the Canon app. I, I should re- recommend the Canon plus app because it, my film is on there, but there's also a ton of amazing uh, audio books and, uh, and, and resources on, and lectures on uh, that, you know, people have to check that out for sure. Uh, so on earth film is where you, you can uh, get um, access to a lot of those links. And you, there's also a link there. Uh, there's a pop-up when you show up on the site that for teach all nations. And when you click on that, it takes you to the lore page. So there will be that that's where the trailer for my film is and the info and um, right now with lore um, if you could find somebody who uh, who has a, a beta su- subscription <laughs> and who happens to have a few invitations left you can get an invite to that and watch the first two episodes that are available um, and so but yeah re- probably the best place to check all that out uh, to have access to all the links is on earthfilm.net Awesome. And can I quickly get from you, are you planning on doing more documentaries after this series? Is there like an in, insider uh, scoop that you can give me about potentially where you might be going from here? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about things. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, figure out where to go uh, next from here. Right now, my immediate um, project finishing this series is to uh, dub the series into Spanish. And my first movie and the, the, the docu-series, is, that's my, my goal. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, my original goal was to for this film to have an impact in the Spanish-speaking world. And so hopefully dubbed into Spanish, because I did do subtitles with the first movie, but obviously, you know, it's kind of hard to read subtitles when you mm-hmm. have these long, uh, you know, people talking head sections and all that. It's not the easiest to watch with subtitles. Uh, so I'm hoping to do that. Um, but after that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about it, thinking about what, uh, I definitely want to do another docu series kind of project. So we'll see. Awesome. Well, I, I'm going to be praying for you, for your wife and for your children. Um, I pray that God blesses you and, and the work that you're doing. Um, and I'm really grateful that you could take some time out of your, your busy schedule um, to come on, on the Cauldron Pool show today. And I hope people go and check out your work. Definitely go and do it. Go support Nathan and everything he's doing. And yeah, thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation, Evelyn.